Ralph, carry on. Thanks very much for the kind and generous invitation. I will return in a promotional fashion that Professor Rice's uh, global environmental history class is one of the best classes I've taken here at Tufts, probably because of the great group of students that we had. I think you'll agree. Um, I also want to thank Sarah for the invitation and thank all of you for, for coming today on a sort of crappy winter day. Uh, appreciate uh, traipsing through the snow. You know, free pizza doesn't hurt, I imagine. Um, I'll grab some later. Um, but uh, I want to get right into what I hope is an interesting story for you to hear today. It's a true story, um, and most of the images that I will show you today are my own. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, I'll start with uh, one of the exceptions. This is uh, Google's photo, uh, not mine. Um, but it shows you the path that I took to get to the place where this story uh, happened. And that is Kamchatka. So uh, start with a question to the uh, audience here. Uh, anybody heard of Kamchatka? We got a few. And um, how do you know about Kamchatka? I've just heard about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've read about it. I've, I've heard about fairs. I'm from Seattle, but I've never been. Okay. Anybody else uh, have a different uh, origin of your knowledge of Kamchatka? Yeah, I'm from Russia and my dad's been here. Aha. Okay. We have um, uh, maybe a native speaker uh, of the languages I heard while I was, I was there. Um, anyone heard of it from the game of Risk? Yeah, got a, got a couple hands. <laughs> I didn't play Risk, but when I tell this story, almost inevitably somebody says, oh yeah, Kamchatka from Risk. It was really a strategic place um, to, to, uh, to have as a territory. Um, and it was a very strategic place as well to go to photograph uh, wildlife. Um, and you mentioned bears, Colin. Um, in the area that we photographed in, there are approximately three or four Russian brown bears per 25-ish square miles. So, so a fairly dense population of um, uh, brown bears. This peninsula is known for its abundant uh, wildlife, flora. I am not a biologist, a geologist, a historian. Um, so the knowledge that I have of Kamchatka comes from going there and then a little research online. Um, so probably as we get into Q&A, uh, I may fail to answer some of those sort of questions, but I can continue to tell you the story which um, uh, following our arrival in the city known as Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, which is a city of about 200,000 people. Um, it's the only, you know, big city on this peninsula. You can't get there from mainland Russia by car. You have to fly in. There are roads uh, on this peninsula. They tend to be gravel roads for the most part. There is some paved uh, road area around, PK as they call it. Uh, but I flew in there uh, in August of uh, 2018, so about a year and a half ago, uh, to join a group of wildlife photographers, a couple of professional wildlife photographers, one of whom I had studied with before, traveled with before. Uh, her name is Daisy Gillardini, uh, expert at uh, polar photography, so uh, both poles, um, and also uh, extremely good with bears, and polar bears in particular, but brown bears as well, um, from her travels in uh, the Canadian Arctic and uh, in Alaska. So I knew um, she was someone I wanted to study with. I heard about this trip, so I signed on, uh, without knowing very much about where I was going, uh, what we would see there, other than for sure seeing some bears. Um, so uh, the uh, next part of the trip from PK was down to this, um, oh, I've got a laser pointer right here, um, lake. It's Lake Kuril, just about the southern uh, tip of this peninsula. And it does have um, several rivers that um, flow out of it to the uh, open Pacific here. And then I believe this is known as the um, Sea of Okhotsk. 
Does that, does that sound right, uh, my Russian speaker? Um, <clears throat> so this, this was about a, I don't know, about a 45 minute helicopter ride. Uh, here's a shot of our uh, kind of cool looking helicopter. It's a retired Russian military Mi-8 uh, helicopter with uh, some, some really uh, nice uh, decorations on the outside that I thought was, was worth a shot before we got into it. Um, and then uh, took off into this absolutely stunning landscape. Uh, I'm not saying my image is stunning, but I'll tell you the volcanoes that we were flying over, the, um, uh, the, the volcanic uh, steam that was coming out of many of them um, is uh, representative of this whole peninsula, which has, I believe, over 200 volcanoes on it, of which about 30 are active. So it's a, uh, an active uh, seismic area. Uh, we didn't have any earthquakes while we were there, but we did see um, some of that volcanic steam coming out of uh, several of the volcanoes. Um, before we even got there, uh, we saw a bear. And so what you're seeing at the bottom here is the lake. Uh, it kind of looks like a flipped sky a little bit when you look at it that way, but this is the, uh, the shoreline of the lake. And right here is a Russian brown bear. Even before we um, had landed, uh, we, we got a, a, a sighting. Um, and this is the shot of our camp, uh, which I took as we were coming in for a landing. Um, so uh, this whole area here, uh, surrounded by an electrified fence to keep us safe from the bears at night. Um, these are the tents we slept in. We uh, ate our meals in this little um, cabin here. Uh, bathroom out here. Way back here was um, uh, where the Russian staff uh, slept and um, uh, around the corner, uh, a sauna and shower, which I was allowed to use twice during the week. So, you know, it was a, a little bit rustic. Um, probably for more for my tent mate uh, who uh, shared one of these uh, little brown tents uh, for the week. So um, this is a shot, not of our helicopter landing. I wouldn't have been able to take that. But later in the week, another group came in. Uh, and so I, I took the, uh, the opportunity to, to shoot a, a, a helicopter coming in for a landing. Um, soon after we landed, we were in one of these um, uh, two small boats that we used to get to the other side of the lake, where we had heard there were uh, a number of active bears and we could start our photography expedition. Uh, uh, this guy over here um, was my tent mate, Neil Parisi. He's a, 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 a pretty well-established wildlife photographer uh, who has a gallery uh, up at Big Bear in California. Um, and uh, he put up with me for the, for the week. Um, so we're, we're in these little boats going uh, across the lake. And sure enough, uh, before we even got to where we were going to photograph, we saw another uh, brown bear and a cub here um, uh, within minutes of, uh, of heading out on the water. Um, so it was, uh, it was, we were off to a good start. Um, and this is my very first you know, real <laughs> uh, photograph of one of these Russian brown bears. Uh, I, I know that from the timestamp and the series of, of images that I took. So um, um, very quickly we were, we were off and running, so to speak. Um, and, um, and very close uh, to these uh, creatures. Um, I would say on average we were in that sort of 20 to 30 foot uh, area at the closest. Um, and then, you know, more often we uh, were viewing them from, from a little bit more safe distance. And that safety was enhanced by having a couple of Russian guards uh, with rifles um, at all times. And this was not something we asked for or requested, it was park rules. So this is a Russian national park. Um, they uh, entertain um, tourists like ourselves. Uh, some of whom are ecotourists um, and um, photographers as well. Uh, so there were a couple of these uh, guards with us um, at all times. 
Uh, this is Vadim. Uh, curiously, the other uh, guard was also Vadim, uh, made for easier name learning. Um, but I'll tell you the, the expression on Amit Eschel's face here, he was one of the two pro photographers in our um, uh, expedition. Uh, he's an Israeli uh, who brought uh, seven Israeli photographers with him to this uh, expedition. Um, but you can see here on his face what we were all feeling, which was this sort of giddy excitement uh, of being so close to these guys and seemingly um, safe. And, and I say that because um, we're not on their menu. They're doing something to fatten up for the winter, which is fishing for sockeye salmon. And um, uh, so, you know, even though we were lined up and photographing, and by the way, this is a, a, a neighboring group from later in the week, but I, I, I put this picture in here to show you what it sort of looked like for us, lined up, taking uh, images of, of these bears. Um, and, you know, they were busy. Uh, they were busy fishing. Uh, this happens to be a, uh, a, a nice perch uh, to see the fish as, as they swim by, and the fish are are spawning. Um, what I have read since coming back from this trip is that Kamchatka um, is responsible for about 20% of the spawning of Pacific salmon. And all six species of uh, salmon spawn on this peninsula. But these guys were after um, uh, sockeye. And because that was such a nice little perch, uh, they would fight over it. So very first day, we have the opportunity to see uh, uh, two bears fight uh, for this spot. Uh, the fight lasted you know, 10 or 15 minutes. It was more um, bark than bite, so to speak, although they weren't barking. Um, but um, on, the, on the conclusion of that fight, uh, this was uh, the winner, male big bear. And he um, peed on the sand. This is the beach of the lake, right? Then rolled in it like you would see a, a, you know, a dog rolling in something stinky. Um, and then proceeded to back up to just about every bush and tree in the area, obviously marking um, his territory, while the, uh, the, the, the loser um, sort of uh, you know, sh strolled sheepishly uh, down, the, down the beach. So uh, uh, a lot of splashing. Um, going on, um, and my understanding is um, they're successful about 25% of the time. So we saw a lot of splashing, which made for, for uh, kind of cool uh, photos, um, and when they missed, which was 75% of the time, they would frequently stand up on their hind legs. And this guy is you know, basically saying, well, where did it go? Um, and sometimes that would result in another pounce, uh, sometimes successful, sometimes not. But this uh, posture that we saw every day, um, to me, was so human looking that I instantly understood why so many groups of indigenous peoples believed that bears were our ancestors. Um, so a uh, little help for me in, in understanding um, uh, some other cultures, including the cultures that uh, initially inhabited this, this area, the Koryuk and other, other uh, uh, peoples. Um, but occasionally, uh, as I said, you know, maybe a quarter of the time, they're successful in capturing uh, one of these sockeye salmon. And you know, lo and behold, I was also uh, successful in my capture. Uh, you know, isn't it funny that photographers use these words like capture and shoot? Um, to talk about what they do. Um, th th these are hunting uh, kinds or, or military kinds of uh, uh, language to, to describe what, what, uh, what we do in, in hopefully an, uh, a peaceful or more hygienic kind of way uh, than, than hunters do. Um, the very first thing uh, they would do on capturing one of these uh, salmon is tear the skin off. And I wish I'd included one of these shots because the, the, the skin would come uh, stretching off. And that, of course, is one of the most high caloric 
uh, parts of the fish. So it was their first um, uh, taste of the fish. And then if that fish was spawning, you would see the, the eggs, uh, those little bright orange eggs, um, come flying out. They would try to scoop as many of them as they could. And my understanding is towards the end of the season, so this would be more in September, October, that's all they eat because they're, they're really getting fattened up at this point. And, um, and so they, they're after the very highest calorie uh, part of the fish, which is the, the eggs and the skin. Um, I, I should mention here, though, that um, from other people in our group and the, the Russians that were in the camp that we talked to, there were not as many salmon as they were used to. And Amit, the guy who was uh, lying on the beach, uh, giddy, uh, in an earlier slide, uh, had been there before and used his drone to take some shots of this area. And his images are just filled with uh, sockeye salmon below, just below the surface of the water. And so I, I asked, you know, what, what, what's going on? And the speculation was that because of climate change, the salmon are getting their signal to spawn later. And the threat then to the bears would be if they don't have enough time between that spawning initiation and the winter snows coming in, they won't have enough time to fatten up enough to get through their hibernation. So, you know, early to make these conclusions, certainly based on very limited data that, that I was able to gather, but concerning nonetheless, um, yet another possible impact of the warming uh, of the planet. Um, as I said, um, guards were there for our protection. I never saw one of them actually raise or point one, one of their rifles. But I did wonder, you know, what was their impact on the bears simply from maybe the smell of their adrenaline? I mean, we were all a little bit nervous, especially on day one. And I imagine, you know, having to guard us tourists might have created some nervous energy Bears are known for having great olfactory uh, sense, and did they, in fact, um, uh, a sense uh, their nervousness? Um, and how would that affect uh, their own behavior? So as much as I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm being as hygienic as possible coming into this remote wilderness area, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking more and more, you know, you just can't be that way in the world. You're impacting the world. Um, so this uh, shot might produce uh, a thought in some of you, wow, that's really close. Keep in mind, I've got a telephoto uh, lens. Uh, you know, I'm roughly 500 millimeters of, of focal length here that's pulling the bear in. But as I said, you know, we're about 10, 15 yards uh, away from, from this guy. Um, that evening, you know, we were treated to a nice sunset with the uh, Ilyinsky volcano in the background. Um, so a great first day uh, of photography. Um, very next day, we wake up. It's, it's pretty windy. And um, we were told we couldn't get in the boats. A little disappointment, having had such a great first day. But we were told very close to the camp, there was a uh, spot we could photograph the bears from a bridge. This is a shot of the bridge I took on our last day as we were flying out, because uh, I didn't have a drone. Um, but um, this bridge here goes uh, across the river. This river goes out to the Pacific Ocean. And um, though you can't see it in this shot, uh, bears would fish in this area because this bridge also served as a type of um, counting uh, location for the researchers. There were Russian uh, researchers there who were uh, counting, measuring the uh, spawning uh, and the, the number of salmon that were uh, coming to the, to the site. So um, we walked, you know, maybe a 10 minute, uh, you know, not even a half mile uh, from the camp to get to this spot. And we were treated almost immediately with a mother bear and her three cubs. 
Um, and we got to photograph this little family uh, for about an hour. Um, it was about as close to a live teddy bear experience as, as you can imagine. Um, and so I got some nice uh, portraits of them uh, playing and uh, uh, um, just, just a delightful hour or so. Um, and uh, you know, we're on this, uh, this bridge, the wind is blowing, and one little mishap that, that happened at this point was um, that um, one of the uh, Israelis in the group uh, had um, emptied his backpack of gear. So, you know, we're all wearing these photo backpacks with lenses and maybe an extra camera body, uh, whatever else we needed. Um, and um, as he was emptying his backpack, the wind picked up the empty backpack and threw it into the river. And this river has Russian brown bears uh, in it, so you know none of us were going after his backpack. But at the same time, you know it's it's uh, it's flowing down to the uh, to the ocean. We wave goodbye to his backpack, sort of ceremoniously, and you know that was that. Um, we kept we kept on uh, uh, photographing, uh, and um, uh, I guess this one is is proof that. Bears do poop on the beach, uh, not just in the woods. Um, but you know, again, great, um, great uh, second day. Uh, it's about lunchtime now, um, and we go back to the camp to have our lunch. The plan was, you know, if the wind died down, we'd get in the boats again. If not, we'd return to the bridge because you know we'd had a great morning there. Um, at the conclusion of lunch. Um, we were informed that we could not leave the camp. We didn't know why. Um, a little later into the afternoon, we're still confined to the camp. It's like 2 o'clock now. And uh, we were told that one of the two Vadims was missing. Uh, I thought nothing of it. Oh, he's you know, visiting his girlfriend or something. I, I don't know what I was thinking. None of us were really thinking about it very seriously. Um, didn't cross my mind that maybe his girlfriend couldn't helicopter in uh, that afternoon, or I don't know. I just, it wasn't on our mind that anything uh, might have happened to him, that he would turn up. The rest of the afternoon goes by. He hasn't turned up. We can't leave the camp. We're forbidden from leaving the camp until they either find him alive or dead. Uh, next morning, it's even windier. Uh, we're con still confined to camp. It's pouring rain. It's windy. I mean, talk about dark and stormy. Uh, this, this was a nasty day. We made the best of it. The, the two professionals in our um, expedition showed us some nice presentations. We, we made a sort of educational uh, moment out of it. Um, but as the morning um, uh, uh, wore on, um, despite the bad weather, two more helicopters showed up. Uh, hunters, police, rangers, and now the mood has really darkened. I mean, not just the weather, but we all realized something really terrible has happened. So we got the news uh, a little later uh, in the morning that they found his body. Uh, the younger Vadim, uh, age 23, had been found. Um, this is, um, again, an aerial shot of that bridge where the backpack disappeared. And Vadim, and again, this is some speculation, some sort of secondhand, thirdhand, through a Russian translator, had apparently decided for himself that he would go back for that backpack. He didn't take a friend. He didn't tell his supervisor. He broke safety rules by doing all of that. But perhaps, you know, out of the goodness of his heart or to establish himself in his new job, he returned to the site to, uh, to get that backpack. And um, in finding his um, mauled and uh, semi-eaten body and bones, and I guess I should have had a trigger warning here, Professor Rice, but um, <clears throat> uh, 
they, they uh, saw signs of a skirmish. And um, in fact, what this um, young uh, park ranger had stumbled into was a food cache. He um, was in the presence of uh, two uh, Russian brown bears when he died uh, who were eating a dead bear. Now, these bears are not carnivores. Uh, so what had likely happened was the dominant bear in that area had killed another uh, 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 challenging bear. And that bear left for dead was then opportunistically being fed on by uh, these two other bears that Vadim encountered. So after a, a warning shot, uh, which he had been probably trained to shoot first, uh, he was quickly um, overtaken um, by, by the bears. Um, so, you know, we, we were shocked. Uh, this, is, uh, this is day three in Kamchatka for us. And we're, we're due to be there for a full week uh, of photography. Um, and needless to say, uh, you know, not what any of us were ready for. Um, you know, the, the, the story still is a little bit difficult for me to tell. Um, and, you know, in part because um, this is Vadim, age 23, uh, just graduated from Irkutsk University, agrarian university. He had uh, done some training at the Park Ranger Academy. Um, and this was his first job out of college. Um, so, you know, 23, just starting life. And he made a mistake. And unfortunately, the last one that, that he gets to make. Um, I, I think another sort of, you know, hit you over the head part of the story for me was, um, or, or the experience, was that um, in learning of the, the aftermath of his death, what we discovered was those two bears had been shot by the hunters that flew in. And the belief, and I think you know, some of you may have heard this before, is that you know, once they get the taste of human blood, they're going to kill again. I have not seen any research that would back that up. Um, they don't wait to find out if they don't kill again. And in large part, I think, you know, wherever the state park is where, or national park where this might happen, you know, the administrators are concerned that they create the right PR story for future tourists or, or uh, um, their own economy, really. So, uh, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about feeling, you know, we were being hygienic. Uh, in, in coming to this remote wilderness area, <laughs> clearly we were not. I mean, I didn't directly cause uh, Vadim's death, but I have to think, you know, indirectly, yes, our group did. And two beautiful Russian brown bears also. So, um, <laughs> next day, we're back to photography uh, as best we could. I mean, it just wasn't the same from there out through the end of the week. We, we did our best to kind of like refocus. We'd all taken not just the time, but a significant amount of our own personal resources to get to this place. So we did our best to kind of um, move on. Um, but it was tough. Um, that said, some of the images I took in the next few days are, are some of the images I feel most proud of. Um, and and uh, I, I've continued to sort of leverage this work, uh, bring it into printmaking, um, and, and other ways of showing the images that I'd like to uh, hopefully share with you before the, the lunch is, is finished. Um, let me see if I can get back to a couple of these shots. It's an absolutely gorgeous area. Um, and and I, you know, I think that's what, how I tried to carry myself 
uh, forward during these uh, next few days was just to absorb myself in the beauty uh, of nature. Um, and uh, a shot I took um, on our way out. Um, but looking back uh, on the experience, I have a number of questions that continue to, uh, I won't say haunt me, but certainly drive a lot of the artwork that I've tried to create since. And I, I want to um, move to sort of a, a, a Q&A period, but uh, unlike most Q&A uh, where you ask me, I really want to ask you guys uh, some questions because they're, they're on my mind. And it starts with, you know, what's the nature of the impact we have on each other? What's the nature of the impact we have on the world when we step out every morning? What's the nature of the impact we have in the decisions that we make every day? How do we choose the risks we take? I mean, this was a little bit of a risky trip. Um, we all take risks in our life. I think as I get uh, a little bit older, maybe a few less risks than, than maybe some of you are willing to make. Um, but then again, I start to think about my mortality, my legacy. What, what does my life mean? How can I leverage my work in a way that's meaningful? How can I use it to raise awareness or create engagement or, or raise a, a sense of urgency about the crisis that our planet is in? You know, what can I do locally um, to, to help those causes? Uh, whether that be, you know, climate change or uh, endangered habitats or um, other, other issues that we're all uh, aware of. And, you know, ultimately, it really boils down personally to my own relationship with nature. I mean, I, I continue to sort of ask myself, well, what did all this mean for me? And it, it was the beginning for me of just trying to understand my own personal relationship with nature. What, is it, what does it really mean for me to have places where I can go and do these sorts of things? Even at the expense of producing more carbon emissions. I know my flight to this place uh, was one of the most impactful things I'll do, certainly that year, um, in terms of not being carbon neutral. I mean, by, by a, a long stretch. Um, so, so that's kind of what I want to ask you guys. Um, I mean, that's my story. <laughs> I'm sticking to it, so to speak, or it's sticking to me. <laughs> um, but, but what does it make you think about, and how would you answer any of those questions? So I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Ralph, for this amazing presentation. And I, I guess you have already asked all of the questions we would ask you. <laughs> Um, but I guess I will turn it back to you and also I would like to open it to the audience to see if you want to comment on any of those questions Ralph has posed. But I sense you have a sense of guilt when you talk about your impact. So it seems like you're walking in, in a fine line between yeah. pleasure and guilt. Right. And I wanted to hear more about you, uh, your yeah. sense. Can you elaborate on, on your feelings of being yeah. in nature? Yeah, I would say guilt mixed with um, outrage, fatigue, mixed with um, the feeling that I've got to, you know, live day to day like we all do. Um, so the, increasingly I am making little decisions that help me kind of feel better. Uh, meat pretty much out of my, I'm not saying I'm, Vague, vegan or vegetarian yet, but uh, I'm not eating those grass-fed beef uh, uh, that, that Professor Rice told me is just about equivalent to a, fl a cross-country flight. Um, I walked here from North Cambridge. I just used my car less. I I'm trying to do some of those little things. I know it's not having the kind of impact that I'd really like to have, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I was... 
uh, referring specifically to your presence in nature yeah. as a wildlife photographer. Right. Is, that, is the guilt more than the pleasure? Yeah. Um, n no. I mean, I, I love the animals. <laughs> I mean, that sounds sort of trite, but this for me, and when I've had opportunities since then to go to uh, the Canadian Arctic, and I just got back from Antarctica uh, two weeks ago, um, I, I just love the animals. I mean, I, I, just sitting on the ice and having penguins come up to me, I know I'm incredibly privileged to be able to do that. Um, after a long career doing something else that helped me sort of build up a little bit of nest egg so I can afford to do that. But um, I want to then be able to use that work toward some contribution. Exactly how that works out, I don't know yet. Thank you. Does anybody want to comment? Um, just similarly touching on the um, topic of guilt and what you're talking about, I think um, it's fascinating hearing you kind of have these discussions with yourself about the impact that you and others around you are making on the earth and then what you yourself are doing to kind of deal with those feelings. Um, and I think for me personally and as well through research, um, the idea of thinking about kind of guilt and maybe like anxiety or, you know, fatigue about all the um, outrage that we're feeling around this is to remember that the causes behind all of this are systemic um, and that it's not right. you or any of us right. in this room that individually caused this crisis. It's because of this massive system that's been built up. And in terms of relieving our guilt and actually making a difference and using your own professional and personal lives, thinking collectively and um, ambitiously together is way more powerful than right. us having these small yeah. little individual actions. Yes. Um, and I think it's fascinating to really explore how your art could intersect with activism and other bigger collective movements yeah. in that. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's my next step. And, and I've started to explore through um, Patty Loper at SMFA, who's involved in uh, Extin Extinction Rebellion, um, and thinking about ways I can uh, combine my art with activism, civil disobedience to start to have a bigger impact. The idea of impact yeah. is like a major win for me. When I look yeah. at Washington, D.C., yeah. and I see what's going on, yeah. and I find it absolutely impenetrable. Right. I could write something brilliant. I could draw, I draw a cartoon. Yeah. I could draw a meaningful cartoon. It's not going to do a thing. Right. So for me, the only thing I can do is something local. I do a lot of yeah. canoeing on the Mystic River. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there was a lot of untreated human waste right. that goes down the Mystic River and the Merrimack River and other rivers. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time That's great. fighting that. And I've gone to the state house, I give yeah. legislation or I give testimony on bills. And that gives me a satisfaction that somehow I'm pushing yeah. back. That's nice. And then the, other, the yeah. big scale is just so frustrating. Right. Nuts. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think it's either or, right? It's not no. just local or, or individual, and it's not uh, just collective activism. Um, we can do both, right? They're, they're not mutually ex exclusive. But, but that, uh, that sounds like a great uh, contribution. I think that your story was much better for that tragedy, uh, showing the reality of going to the other side of the planet and getting close to nature. Uh, without that that tragedy, the story might be something more like, well, you can spend a little bit of money and some time and rough right. it for a bit and get real close to these cuddly bears, even right. though they're killers, supposedly, but look how close I can get. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I think, great job, thank you. Thank you, yeah, I, I, I do wanna say that some of the ideas people have about bears as you know, ferocious killers, uh, it's largely myth. I mean, what happened to this guy was entirely uh, a, a result of, of bears being bears, which involves being threatened with respect to their food source. And this guy was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The, the, otherwise, 
uh, no, nothing would have happened to any of us. But I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I wouldn't be here telling this story it, probably if there weren't this, this element which heightened all of our uh, sense of um, mortality and um, the, the kinds of questions that I've been posing to myself in my, in my work. I wanted to thank you. Um, photography is a beautiful medium, as, as you know personally. And it reminds me of last night there was a talk by Doug Tallamy, who's, who recently wrote a book, Nature's Best Hope. And part of what was so effective about his talk was the beautiful photographs of insects that he wove through the entire talk. And, and he was doing it in a way to sort of describe how our actions can help. And so I do think that this kind of photography just sends a message um, that's, that's really powerful. But I also wanted to sort of reflect on sort of our instincts to kill the two bears. Yeah. So I was um, in Costa Rica and there was a huge Ferdinand snake in the bathrooms. And my colleague, who was, is very adept with snakes, picked it up and carried it across the river and came back. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, and, he, and, he, and they, when he came back, they said, well, why didn't you kill it? And he says, I don't want to give you a false sense of security. So there, are, there will be another one somewhere. Yeah. So they yeah. really haven't solved things. And it's a little bit like yeah. someone gets Zika virus and now we spray every yeah. habitat with pesticides. And so yeah. I do think we have to find a way to work on the, the knee-jerk response to, yeah. to annihilate when something yeah. happens. Yeah, th th this was a, a, you know, a situation in which we, we were guests and totally um, subject to the uh, actions and rules of the Russian authorities in the park, uh, but it angered all of us that these two bears uh, were shot. Um, one of whom was uh, uh, killed on the spot, and the other was apparently wounded and probably died in his den, you know, after suffering. Uh, so, you know, just another uh, aspect of the tragedy that shocked us and, and you know, left us with uh, an unforgettable experience. In your um, efforts to, to think about what kind of impact you can have through the work, I'm not hearing that you're trying to make solutions because right. you're, you're uh, yeah. readily admitting what yeah. you don't know and, and what you're learning. Um, but as an artist with the Oh, the plat like accessing platforms where people can receive a message. Are you right. thinking about? Um, do you want that person to feel the feelings that you have felt in creating the work? Like, what is the emotion that you? Right. Is there an emotion that you feel is yeah. most effective if the audience that receives right. your work? So, so just a couple of, uh, of reactions to that. One is my being here talking to you today is part of that artwork. So I know in some uh, ways of thinking, the art is the two-dimensional print on the wall or the electronic image on the screen or in my Instagram account or wherever. But socially engaged art means bringing your art out to the world and talking to people about it. So, so I feel like that's what I'm starting to do more. Um, you know, what sort of impact did I have today in this room? To me, that's part of my practice. Um, but then in part two of my answer, uh, which is a great challenge, by the way, and thank you, um, uh, what I have started to do, and Professor Rice uh, referred to this, is I, I've taken some of the bear images out to public places and hung them up. And this is Middlesex Fells um, State Park, um, north of Medford. Uh, I've done this as well in Cambridge at Fresh Pond. Uh, this is the fence that goes around the water source. And um, I hang the banners up in these places and hang around. And inevitably, people come by, some, some with their dogs. <laughs> this particular dog I found just fascinating reaction to a picture of a bear, was convinced that the bear was a threat. Um, but in any case, the reason for doing this is what happens after I put the images up. 
which is that people come by, they look, they say, hey, these bears don't belong here. And I get into conversations about climate change, endangered species. Um, uh, you know, the question I ask them, if, if there's time and, and we get to it, is, you know, wouldn't it be terrible if this were the only way to see wildlife for our children or grandchildren? You know, that they had to see photographs or videos or animatronics at Disney World um, instead of being able to do what I know I've done in a very privileged fashion, um, but still is a possibility for all of us here, which is go out and see um, wildlife in, in their natural habitats. Um, and I think if those conversations end with, you know, who are you voting for? Or, you know, what are you doing individually? Um, I, I think I'm heading in the right direction. Am I, you know, is this a solution? Um, no, and you know, I think that the comment earlier about you know, activism in a more collective fashion is certainly gonna be more impactful long, run, long range, but this is one way I've decided I can take my art uh, out into the world and, and uh, maybe get someone a little bit more activated. You know, I also recognize that Cambridge is a bubble, right? That, you know, we voted 90% Hillary. Uh, so I'm almost always preaching to the converted. Um, so my challenge is do this in Kansas, which I understand, you know, has Kansas City in it, right? Uh, oops, I couldn't resist that one. Um, but, but, you know, your challenge is really uh, something I'm, I am grappling with. How can I take this to, to the next step? And that's part of my journey, you know, within the master's program. This is a new world for me. I spent 25 years in the world of market research for biotech. Um, so I, I'm starting kind of a new um, chapter. So uh, other questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, I was thinking of all of us that would like to get into the wild and then also the tourist industry. And I do right. have a colleague friend that you may have heard of, Peter Prokash, who also was a photographer and he was um, concerned about the tourists yeah. that, are, you know, that are potentially destroying what it is they're interested in seeing, right. whether that's an Antarctic boat yeah. or you know, the Arctic, et cetera. So he actually started something called Linking Conservation and Tourism, hmm. which has been growing. And um, there's a huge emphasis, instead of the hotel being built and sending in all the beef and the wine and they're from all over the right. world, of these places in the wild, yeah. uh, engaging with native people to grow the native foods and, that, hmm. and all that. So it's just, uh, there are ways that we right. pay attention that we can do a better job get out to the wild and, and have the money and the resources go to protecting it. Right, right. yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that. I'd love to get more information about Peter's uh, so business or... Tourism, yeah. It seems like it's another step. You know, that take. So, some of the um, options that I have when I, I look at these sort of photographic symposia uh, or, or expeditions, um, are clearly not as good a choice as others once you sort of, you know, roll back the, the layers of the onion. Um, I was um, uh, on two expeditions by a company called One Ocean, and they're giving back. They take, take a portion of their profits and uh, support, you know, the WWF and, you know, other conservation organizations. So. I think you can make more conscious choices about ecotourism, um, but again, kind of goes back to it's impossible to not have some impact when you travel, especially. Uh, so, so how do we do that with you know with responsibility? Hi, I was wondering about some of the uh, creative and technical challenges that you face as an artist going to photograph um, these bears or wildlife in general. Yeah, great question. Um, so w when I've been showing some of this work, and in particular, I'm really talking about some of the more um, 
conventional images. Um, the response I, I've been getting from sort of the contemporary fine art photography community is, oh, that's Nat Geo. And a part of me goes, yeah, <laughs> because it means that technically, which is part of your question, right? Technically, I think there are some uh, aspects to my work that sort of conform to that world. But what they're also saying are a couple things kind of under the surface because Nat Geo has this long history that was part and parcel to colonialism, that was um, you know, sort of this superior observer of native tribes. Um, it, it, it's not a very proud history to be associated with. Um, so you know, part of my own creative struggle is how do I um, uh, create uh, images that show the beauty of nature or uh, wildlife, but not you know, tap into that, uh, that world. Um, one of my answers to that, and so thanks for the segue uh, into showing some other um, work that I've done recently, um, has been to photo montage some of these images. Um, this is the uh, fountain at the Boston Public Library. Um, so I've taken sort of a, a, pieces of the uh, wildlife photography and collage them with urban settings. And again, you know, what, I, what I'd like people to think about is what are we doing to make sure that they have their own natural habitat and not um, uh, an urban setting? Which, by the way, you know, in some Russian Arctic small towns it is happening. The, the, bear, the polar bears are coming to look for food um, right into their, their villages. Uh, here's another one I did sort of in a similar vein uh, with a polar bear image at the uh, Christian Science uh, Fountain um, downtown Boston. And then the other thing I've been doing, uh, which is to sort of stretch and enhance some of the imagery, is I've been bringing them into other forms of printmaking. Uh, so this is a woodblock um, I did uh, last year. Um, and I have one other wood block that um, I, I did uh, last semester. Um, and you know, what am I doing here? I, I think what I'm, uh, I'm trying to do is return uh, the bear, in a sense, back to uh, a piece of nature. These are wood blocks, so I'm carving the wood physically to bring their image back into a natural substance. Um, does that come across? I don't know, but I, I, at, at least what I'm hopeful of is that they're emotive, that people feel good about looking at them, and that that then can start a conversation. Because this is what's at stake, right? If we screw up, that good feeling that I enjoy and maybe feel a little bit guilty about when I go to these places, um, that, that uh, you know, we lose that opportunity. So, hey, I, we still I, have a little bit of time. Go I ahead. wanted to first thank you. Um, and I had the kind of, because you started off with a question for us as to um, how do you reconcile with uh, the beauty that you get to enjoy, but also of the damage that may incur. An idea that I had that might be of help uh, in terms of instilling long-term changes for this exact kind of presentation to be given at schools for, oh. for kids because they, they're going to be the ones to be uh, incarnating more of the problems than we are. Oh. But also they will be able to gain a sensitivity to this much early on, which I think will have a lot more lasting impact, especially through the medium that you're doing this through pictures. I think could be a, a great, great benefit um, for not just us, but also people who are still learning to uh, understand the values of nature and protection. So I think this has really a lot of potential uh, to many audiences and especially to those that are growing up right now. Thank you, I, it's a fabulous idea. What's the right age and should I include the tragedy? I think uh, you can dull down the tragedy a little bit, uh, <laughs> but I think the right age is, uh, yeah. you know, very early or five years old until, yeah. uh, you know, through high school, I think it'd be, 
I mean, personally, I think uh, conservation and the importance of nature should be taught in values in, in schools, you know, when you're a kid. From when you're five and you're planting in a garden until you're in high school and biology learning conservation. So I think this would have a lot of value in that regard. Thank you. I, I think what would maybe complete that picture and, and might make an invitation more forthcoming would be for me to collaborate with a scientist so that you know, some of the pseudoscience that I presented today, because that's not my background, might be more enriched for the kids. But I think it's a great idea. I can't wait for that invitation. <laughs> To conclude, I would like to ask you to reflect a little bit on your path, because it sounds like you had a very unconventional journey until where you are now. How did you suddenly, or was it suddenly, that you became a wildlife photographer? How did that happen? Well, I, I probably have to go back to just my early interest in photography itself. And you know, I've been in the dark room and with a camera in my hand since I was about 12 or 13. My father was an optical engineer, so we always had lenses and cameras all over the house. He built a dark room in the basement, and I hung out there a lot through high school. Um, so I was one of those nerdy kids that worked on the yearbook. Uh, and I've been photographing ever since, but not as uh, the sort of core of my career. For one reason or another, um, I went in other directions. So. Now, um, it's kind of like the itch that ha I've wanted to scratch for a long time, and I, I get to do that. But it wasn't enough for me to just um, make pretty pictures. So a, a lot of my post back program and now the MFA program has been trying to figure out um, you know, where, where to drive that. Thank you so much.